Good morning. I'll say it a little louder for those folks out in the foyer still. Come on in. Come join us. Uh, I want to just obviously we want to share a few things that we have going on uh, coming up. Um, one of the things that we want to be especially mindful, and part of the reason that we're not starting on time is because everyone is giving Sue a hug, and rightly so. This is a big corporate hug from us to you and your family. Um, as many of you probably heard, Dennis passed away this last week, and that guy's an amazing guy. I don't have to tell you that, you all know that, but it's just his spirit and his stamina uh, in the face of just incomparable challenges, and Sue and her spirit in caring for him for all these years um, is a tribute to God's strength and God's power. And so we are going to miss him, uh, and rightly so. We will have a memorial service for him uh, here at the church, 11 o'clock this coming Friday, Friday the 17th. We are, you're obviously all invited, and we, we want to celebrate a life well worth celebrating. It's good to see you here today. How are you doing? You got, you got, you got the important people with you. Yeah, it's good to see them too. Um, also, looking forward a little bit, want to let folks know that we are making plans for our VBS. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet for people that are interested in volunteering down the hallway at the kid, in the kids' department. Um, it's fun. <laughs> By all means, if you have an opportunity, come and, and be a part of that, uh, working with kids. It is tiring. I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, those of you who've worked in uh, VBS before, you know that that's the case. But there is just something about kids getting turned on to Jesus that just is wonderful. So I want to invite you to consider that and, and hopefully sign up for participation in our VBS. Again, down the hallway here, the sign-up sheet. If you need to talk to Amber, uh, she's kind of being the coordinator on that one, putting that together. So that's, that's coming up as well. There's a lot of things I know. It's, uh, check your bulletin, check your bridge, uh, do the website to find these announcements. Um, but right now, we just want to be together. We want to worship God. We want to comfort each other. And we want to celebrate the goodness of God. So I, I'm going to step aside and allow Carol to begin our service today. First of all, happy Mother's Day, ladies, and whoever did these two things, yay team. It is Mother's Day, and I've got a little thing to say in, in a few minutes, but it's beautiful outside, thank the Lord. I thank him so many times a day. I hope you do too. Is that better? Okay. I wouldn't want you to miss anything. <laughs> so, welcome to everybody here. I see lots of people with family, young children. That's absolutely wonderful. Most of you know me, and most of you know that I'm probably the most blessed person in this whole room because I have a little girl. Okay, don't get me started on that. <laughs> Let me just say, the joys of life are simple things we find along the way. A pleasant thought about a friend can brighten any day. We cannot see tomorrow, for it lies around the bend, but we make today more precious when we share it with a friend. So I tried to get this thing organized, and I don't know whether I'm doing it in the order that... What? It's perfect? Oh, that's so hard to look up to, having to think about. The scripture today is 1 John 
verses four, one through six. So, dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. <clears throat> this is how you can this is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. But every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming, and even now is already in the world. You, dear children, are from God, and have overcome them, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Is that the end? No. It's hard to tell. Okay, wait a minute. Be patient with me. He isn't finished with me yet, either. They are from the world, and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and whoever knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. One, two, let's pray. A mother's love. There is no love like a mother's love, no stronger bond on earth, like a precious bond that comes from God to a mother when she gives birth. A mother's love is forever strong, never changing for all time. And when her children need her most, a mother's love will shine. God bless these special mothers God bless them, every one, for all the tears and heartache and for the special work they've done. When her days on earth are over, a mother's love lives on through many generations with God's blessing on each one. Be thankful for our mothers, for they love with a higher love from the power God has given and the strength from up above. Amen. I think it's somebody else's turn. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> Trade your places. Good morning. If you'd all stand with me, join me as we sing Brethren We Have Met to Worship. Is there? 
observe us with sweet manner all around. And now praise, I will praise you, Lord. Oh, you're going to start? Okay. God opens doors. When God leads you to the edge of a cliff, trust him fully and let go. Only one of two things will happen. Either he will catch you when you fall, or he will teach you to fly. Amen. <laughs> Let's thank the Lord for these blessings. Blessings. God closes doors no man can open. God opens doors no man can close. If you need God to open doors for you, ask him. Amen. Thank you. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. Good morning to you too. How are you guys doing? Good? 
Good. All right, so Carol kind of gave it away a little bit. What is today? My oh, my word, you're right. How many of you cooked breakfast for your mom this morning? <laughs> Nobody raising your hand? You did? What'd you make for her? You made an omelet? Wow. No. <laughs> well, eggs. That's good, too. Well, good job. Nicely done. Moms do an awful lot for us, don't they? What's, uh, what's one of the, it'll just take a few, what's one of the neatest things about your mom? Go. That she gave birth. That she gave birth. Yeah, that's pretty important. That's probably the most important thing. How about stuff that she does right now? Anybody want to throw something out? Don't think too hard. You're going to make me nervous. Tell you what, th- getting put on the spot's not fun, is it? Think about it and tell her later, okay? So I want to show you a picture here. It's an old picture. So this church right here, this wasn't where the Church of the Brethren has always been. There's another church that we used to be over that way, in the middle of town on 11th Street, and there was some, some rooms. This, this photograph was taken over that old church. You guys want to come in close and see it? Can you come closer, Nancy, or should I bring it back? Well, you have to get close because there's people in this picture. I want to point some folks out to you, all right? Okay, so this, all these people in this old-fashioned clothes, old-fashioned like 1978 or something like that, <laughs> old-fashioned for us. See this person sitting right here on the edge, kind of with that longish hair right there with a the girl in her lap? You know who that is? You don't know who that is. That's my mom. Oh, oh my word. Yeah, that's my mom right there. Guess who this guy right in the front is right there? You. Yeah, you're right. That's me. What a nerd. Look at that guy. He looks like trouble, doesn't he? Well, this is what I want to tell you about moms, okay? So my mom did a lot of stuff for taking care of us. She made breakfast for us and washed our clothes. and, And she worked as a school teacher. And she did a lot of things. But you know what? All of these other people also helped. That's the neat thing about being a part of the church is that you're never on your own. There's always somebody that's willing to help out. There's a whole bunch of parents out here who want to help you guys make the good decisions that you need to make. That's kind of exciting that it doesn't have to be just one person. You can have your mom or your dad, but you also might have aunts and uncles. You might have grandparents and grandparents that, that, that help you out. You might just have friends of your family, all of whom really want the best for you. All these different people. And sometimes, you know, maybe our families aren't the way that everybody thinks families should be. Maybe we only have one parent. Or maybe we live with our grandparents. That's all okay in God's book because God is always going to put somebody in your life that can help take care of you and teach you what you need to know. That's what I think about when I see all of these people. You know, some of these people in this picture are still here, floating around. Yeah, this is, that's a, yeah, don't, everybody's like, oh, really? That's amazing. Yeah, they're in here. And maybe sometime after church, we'll kind of go through it and I'll point them out to you. But the neat thing to remember is that on Mother's Day, we have really special opportunity to give thanks to God for our mothers, but we can also give thanks for all of the other people that help us in our lives. Okay? Let's remember that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for mothers today. They are amazing. And we know, too, that they're not perfect, just like nobody's perfect, and they make mistakes, and that's okay, because you make up for all of our failings and all of our shortfalls. It is amazing how you love us and you keep us on the straight and narrow path. And Lord, we thank you for all of the people in our lives who help raise us and direct us and guide us where we need to go. Lord, for those of us who are still learning where we need to go, we pray that you would put people in our lives that will do that and keep doing that. And for those of us who maybe are trying to help others find the right way, help us to do that right, to follow you so that we can help others follow you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you guys can go. If you would all stand with me, we're going to sing Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now 
me safe thus far and grace will lead me home yes when this flesh and heart shall fail and mortal I shall cease I shall Gary and Mary Ann are right here in the picture, so, oh, you got to come check this out afterwards. They don't know to check. <laughs> if, I, if I pointed out that little ankle biter that was sitting in the front row, you know, uh, fair's fair on that one. Uh, I'd like to read to you today from Acts. Again, we are traveling through this story that Luke tells about the life of the early church, and in Acts chapter 19, we have this story, begins in the 11th verse of that chapter. Luke writes, God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that when the handkerchiefs and or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some itinerant Jewish exorcists tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the, son, by G, by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Now, seven sons of the Jewish high priest named Sceva were doing this. But the evil spirit said to them in reply, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And then the man with the evil spirit leapt on them and mastered them all and so overpowered them that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. When this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, both the Jews and the Greeks, everyone was awestruck and the name of the Lord Jesus was praised. Also, many of those who became believers confessed and disclosed their practices. A number of those who practiced magic collected their books and burned them publicly when the value of these books was calculated, it was found to come to 50,000 silver coins. And so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Now, I know we like to think of ourselves as reasonable folks, right? That's where we live, in the age of reason uh, there's still something, though, about us that kind of is drawn to this idea of magic. We want conclusive, rational answers to our questions, but somewhere in our imagination, there's a part of us that likes the idea that there are some things that we can't explain. I've got proof if you want it. Back in the early part of the 20th century, uh, there was a book that was written. It was broken into three different volumes, J.R.R. Tolkien wrote this book, a fantasy novel. The title of the book was The Lord of the Rings. And it, was one of the, it is one of the best-selling books of all time. By some estimates, over 150 million copies of this book have been sold. And the books, they're full of 
of, of wizards and magical creatures and swords that glow whenever the bad guys are close by. It has giant eagles and trolls and goblins, rings of power. And it was so popular that back in the 1990s, Peter Jackson, a film director and producer from New Zealand, decided that he was going to make a movie based on this massive book, a, quite an undertaking. And it went on to be an astonishing success. The first film of the trilogy made over $880 million. The second one made more, $950 million. And the third grossed over $1.1 billion. That's a lot of tickets. That's a lot of people going to see these movies. A lot of money for a fantasy story about magic and mythical creatures. We value the rational, we value the reasonable, but there's also part of us that longs for something that reaches out to try to touch this, this something beyond rational, beyond reasonable, something that we take on faith. This story from Acts, the story of Sceva's sons, it, it touches a little on that openness that we have to the unexplainable. But the story's not really about magic. And we ought to be a little careful that we don't pay too much attention to, to that part of the account. So here's the story that Luke has been telling us. Paul and his companions, they've been on this missionary journey. They're traveling around all the different places. Uh, they, they'd been in, in Macedonia. They'd been in Achaia, uh, from the town of Philippi to Thessalonica, on to Corinth. They stayed there for a while. And then they sailed back across the Aegean Sea, back to the... To the, to the east, to the Asian mainland. Now, according to Luke, they end up in Ephesus, the, another of those major cities of the empire. Now, Ephesus has a reputation of being a place that's, that's very well known for its pagan practices. There's a, there's a huge temple to Artemis there, a whole cult that surrounds the worship of Artemis. There's the imperial cult that's very prominent there that venerated the emperor so Ephesus is a place that is open to this spiritual world. Gods and, and goddesses were just part of their cultural atmosphere, the, the air that they breathe. Now Paul comes into town and he does his regular thing. He finds the synagogue and he goes there. He argues with the Jews that are there. He talks about the kingdom of God that Jesus introduces. And he starts again to get pushback, as he normally does, uh, from those that spoke evil of the way. Of Jesus. And so the door begins to close to him there in the synagogue, and again he follows his regular pattern. He goes out into the public sphere and he debates daily, it says, in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. Now this goes on for an extended period of time, two years. And the whole Ephesian community, as a result, comes to know about Jesus. They are aware of what he is saying. Now, all of this is very reasonable and rational work that's being done, but there's also some of that unexplained, miraculous action of the Spirit here, things that might get mistaken for the magical. Luke tells us that there are people that are being healed of all manner of sicknesses, having evil spirits cast out of them simply by coming into contact with Paul's handkerchief. His apron, the sash that he might wear around his waist to tie his, his robes up. Now, obviously, this is noticed. People realize, hey, there's something interesting going on here, particularly in this community that is very open to that kind of stuff, the stuff that looks like magic. And so some of these itinerant exorcists, Luke tells us, they, they start trying to copy what's going on in the Christian community. See, this was pretty common at the time. I mean, this is something that goes on. Like we mentioned, people at this period of history, they're open to the spiritual, open to the unexplainable. They, they just accept that that's part of their life that they don't understand. They're open to the idea that maybe fate or the gods or some power beyond them could impact their lives in a very real and tangible way. So they don't need the rational. They don't need the reasonable explanation for everything. They just accept it as part of their life. It could be, in their minds, just magic. It could be fate. It could be the whim of the gods or the spirits. This, that was explanation enough for them. 
And like anybody would in their place, this is, just makes sense to me, when things go bad, you want to get out of that bad. You want to somehow find a way out of that state. If the reason that you're suffering, if you've identified that as an evil spirit, then you want to get rid of the spirit. You want to find a way to cleanse yourself of that. And so there was this almost an industry, a, a, a cottage industry of exorcism. And the more mystical, the more esoteric, the more, more foreign the exorcist seems to be, then the more popular they were. They must have some kind of knowledge that we don't have to work this work. Now, considering this context, what's going on in Ephesus, it's not really a wonder that the sons of Sceva are aware of what's going on in this new Christian community. Because miracles are happening. There's something miraculous going on around this guy, Paul. He seems to be the center of it. It seems to have something to do with this person that they're talking about, Jesus. I find this really fascinating. It's just amazing stuff. Now Luke, as usual, he's a little sparse with his details here, but this is what it looks like to me. The sons of Sceva, probably banking on that, the ancient and the mystical qualities of their Jewish heritage, they set up this little exorcism business in Ephesus, where if you've got an evil spirit, they can come and they can help you out with this. And like any shrewd business, they pay attention to the competition. If somebody else is having success, they want to maybe tap into that. Now, I don't want to imply that they didn't believe that they were doing something good, providing a necessary service. They may have had the best of intentions here, trying to free people from this bondage to evil. But when they see what's going on with Paul, when they witness the effectiveness in their eyes of Paul, what they think is the effectiveness of Paul, <laughs> then it's natural for them to try to integrate that seemingly successful ritual or incantation or words that, that Paul uses, they, to integrate that into their own toolkit uh, of exorcism. Because that's exactly what Luke tells us that they do. Using the name of Jesus as some sort of an incantation, a magical spell. I want you to hear the words that, that are being used here. This is from the New Revised Version here. I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Adjure. We don't use that word very often, do we? <laughs> Basically, to adjure, it means to, to bind under oath. Okay? To, to command under the penalty of a curse. Mikkel Parsons notes that the adjuration, the act of adjuring, is an attempt to manipulate both the object of the adjuration and the deity whose authority is invoked. I'm going to have control over the evil spirit by controlling the power. That's essentially what the phrase means. Luke uses a different word, a Greek word, or kizo is what he uses, and it means basically the same thing, to put under an oath, to obligate through the swearing of an oath. The point here is that these guys, the sons of, of, of Sceva, are treating the name of Jesus as part of an oath as some sort of a, uh, an incantation, a magical spell, and, and trying to control both the object, the, the evil spirit, the one that they're focused on, and the source of power, Jesus. Now, I'll be clear. Okay, they're, they're not trying to control the real Jesus here, <laughs> the very son of the Most High God, the one with all the authority in heaven and on earth, the one who's seated at the right hand of the Father. no. The very act of using the name of Jesus as some part of a magical spell is proof that they have no idea who Jesus is. To the sons of Sceva, Jesus, ah, that's just a means to an end. It's just a, a, a way to, to turbocharge our exorcisms here, a way to tap into something so that we can further our aims. And because they are certainly messing around with powers that are infinitely beyond their control, it doesn't go well. You can almost see Luke chuckling as he writes this down. It's like, oh, those guys, oh my word. The evil spirit says, Jesus I know and Paul I know. I don't know you guys. I don't know who you are. That's a great line. I love that. That's so fantastic. 
It completely takes the wind out of their magical sails. The sons of Sceva are in way, way over their heads. And then to add actual injury to the insult, the evil spirit overpowers them physically too. They're overcome, they're beaten, they're sent running out of the house naked and bruised. Naked might be a literal description of what happened, but that is very psychological too in that time of uh, uh, people being very conscious of being shamed. These sons of Sceva are, are completely humiliated in this. They are brought by this power of evil, which is greater than what they can muster. They have brought all the way to the very depths of shame. This is the consequence. This is the outcome of trying to use the name of Jesus for some kind of a personal gain, even if that is directed at some good end. When the word gets out here, the, the, the whole Ephesian community is kind of forced to acknowledge the power of God. Many who had become believers now see their books of magical stuff, uh, their fixations, the scrolls, the spells, and the incantations. They see it now. Okay, this, this ain't nothing. This is meaningless. It's powerless. A whole fortune in magical books are burned, and the word of the Lord prevails. It grows mightily, Luke says. Like I mentioned, there is a part of us that's kind of drawn to this idea of the magical in Shakespeare's play Hamlet, Hamlet says to his friends Horatio, you know, there's more going on than you know. There are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in our philosophies. And while it's tempting, I think we need to be careful that we don't follow the same path as the sons of Sceva, making this account about magical powers in the name of Jesus. To be clear, Hamlet is right. There are more things in heaven and earth than our rational and our reasonable minds can comprehend. There are spirits. There are principalities and powers. There is a realm beyond our perception. Just because we live on this side of the enlightenment and reason and rationality are so important to us, it does not mean that the spiritual world has ceased to exist. We're just a little more blind to it. So we should not be dismissive of this kind of miraculous healing that Luke describes. People freed of their bondage and their sickness simply by coming into contact with one of Paul's handkerchiefs. That's a true story. That's an amazing miracle. But we need to be carefully discerning here as we read this text, as we reflect on it, to, to get what we need from the story, what God has for us from the story, because the Spirit of God is speaking to us, but we need to be careful that we're not hearing just what we want to hear. So I want to encourage you not to look at this passage as some sort of a recipe for spiritual or physical healing, as if we could just follow what Luke account that describes here and we could be released from our infirmities that that's the path of the sons of Sceva that's what they do they were looking for some kind of a magical recipe an incantation that would allow them to control the spirits it's not about that it's not about a, it's not a question of of using the right technique in order to get what we want and and while it might offer us hope when it comes to miraculous healing as we read these things, that's a good hope to have. I think we need to have that. It's not really a passage about miraculous healing either. The fact that people are healed, the fact, the fact that they are freed from their bondage to evil, that is part of the story then, just like it is part of the story today. But I don't think it's the central part. Luke is telling us a little something about the way that we encounter the spiritual, the way that the spiritual intersects with the physical. Yeah, that's, that's here, but Luke is really telling us a lot more about Jesus. You see, this is what's going on in all of the stories from Acts. There are these central human characters. We read, we read the text, we see these human characters for sure. In this one, we've got Paul. I mean, he's here. He's not right on the center stage in the front. He's kind of in the background in this story. We've got the sons of Sceva. We've got the good guys and the bad guys, the protagonist and the antagonist. There's also this evil spirit. This person who is uh, possessed of them is kind of in the background. It's the spirit that's speaking to us through the text that 
that individual is an instrument in the hands of the evil spirit. And so this is a complicated story. It's a nuanced story. There's a lot of people kind of playing off each other here. But if you remember, when we started this journey, all the way back when we, when we first started talking about Acts, we remember that, that the book is often called the Acts of the Apostles, but really it's more about the Acts of God. This is what God is doing. It's the Spirit of God that is moving in these stories. If we're paying attention to the story, and I really think we should be paying attention at this level, we'll see that behind all of these human characters, the good guys and the bad guys, is the Spirit of God. God is there. That's the primal story. That's the foundational story. That's the, the big story on which all of our little human stories are written. The story of God's redemptive plan. What God wants to happen. God's will for all of creation. What Luke is really telling us is how God is reconciling all things to himself through Jesus and how this reconciling plan is being worked out, in this case, in the life of the early church, in the life of people like Paul and Barnabas and Timothy and Priscilla and all of the rest of them who are faithful and empowered by God's own spirit. Acts is God's story. What the sons of Sceva were trying to do was to make it their story. Trying to make it about them. They wanted to take God's power, which is beyond comprehension, they wanted to take God's power and put it in a, in a box. Put it into their, their bag of tricks and use it for their own ends. Again, they, they probably had good motives, wanting to free people from the evil spirits that possess them. That's a noble pursuit. But in the hierarchy of their minds, in the way they had it set up, they were on top. We're in control of this, they thought. The name of Jesus. <laughs> oh my goodness. Jesus. You know, the, the, the image of the invisible God, the, the firstborn over all creation. Well, that's just a power to tap into. Again, to turbocharge our exorcisms, to achieve our human goals. This is mind-boggling. It doesn't make any sense when you really stop to think about it. Paul, again, back to Paul. Paul, in the letter they wrote to the Colossian church, he describes Jesus as the one in whom all things were created, things in heaven, things on earth, visible things, invisible things, thrones, powers, rulers, authorities, all subject to Jesus. All things have been created through him and for him. Everything that is. If you need to read this, first chapter in Colossians. Wonderful stuff. But everything that is, spiritual, material, everything is held together in Jesus. Oh my goodness. This is who we're talking about here. How vain, how prideful to think that we could achieve our human ends simply by invoking the name of Jesus. I'll get what I want if I use Jesus' name. To think that the one in whom all creation finds its very being, the one who was before the beginning, the one who has supremacy over everything, the one in whom the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, to think that we could control that for our own benefit, that is dangerously vain. That's where the sons of Sceva are. So to get us in the proper place, to get us where we need to be here, so that we can look at this story, whether we can look at the, really the whole of Scripture more faithfully, I want to point out to you what I think is the most important verse in this passage. You set the rest of it aside. Take this bit home. It's really actually, you know, the, the, just the first part of the verse. It's verse 11. Verse 11. God did extraordinary miracles. I want to let that soak in for a second. The very first word of this text, God. The verb, did. Extraordinary 
miracles. Don't miss this. God does it. God does it. As we read on in the text, Luke describes the method. He talks about handkerchiefs and, and aprons as having healing power. But it's not the cloth. It's not the cloth that touched Paul's skin that has the power. It's not even Paul's skin or Paul himself. There is no healing power in claws or human skin in themselves. Any more than there is healing power in an incantation or a spell or a magical mumble. As Luke tells us, the, the claws, the clothes, the things, the articles, they seem to carry some power. But the real power, the real power here is God's. It is God that is doing this. It's always God that is doing this. It's only God that is doing this. It's not some kind of technique. It's not some recitation of the name of Jesus that heals. It is Jesus himself that heals. I need to drive this point home. We need to understand this. All power comes from God. And outside of the Spirit of God's perfect will and perfect power, well, this is what happens. The sons of Sceva found out what happens to those who try to work outside of that perfect will and that perfect power of God. This is the central truth here that comes forward from Luke's day, a time when, there were, uh, when the awareness of the spiritual realm was greater, to our time when magic is just something for a fantasy movie, a bit of escapism. We've let our rational minds, our reasonable minds, put this sort of miraculous stuff off to the side. We don't really know how to deal with it, so we just won't think about it that much. And we could spend some time today trying to talk about how we might not want to be so quick to dismiss the spiritual things that we can't reasonably explain. But that's not really the point of the passage here. It's not here to convince us of the reality of spirits or the principalities or the powers, the reality of miraculous healings. Yeah, it says that, and that's good. The point of the passage, though, is to warn us of the danger of trying to manipulate God. It's dangerous, folks. Here's something to think about. And we might not be so convinced of the presence of the spiritual, the magical, in our reasonable and rational modern mindset. And that might tempt us to read this passage as just like, oh, that's a neat story. I mean, they were silly back then, thinking about magic and books and incantations and stuff. We might dismiss it in that way. After all, a lot of what's in this passage is not familiar to us, not part of our regular day-to-day. -day. We, don't, we don't have big collections of magical spell books, do we? Not like those folks did. We've moved beyond that, right? Well, have we? This ain't about magical books and scrolls, folks. It's not about spells or incantations. This is a passage about the problem of human pride. Believe me, we've got that. That's still around. The problem is human pride that tries to put the creator of the universe in a box that we can draw from to get what we want. Now, don't get too hard on these people. Those folks in Ephesus, they were just trying to do what we do all the time. Human stuff. Trying to make the best life that they could. Trying to carve out something, something good, something that we could do with the resources they had at hand. This is what we've got, let's work with it. Let's make something good of it. For the Ephesians, for the, the sons of Sceva, magic. Magic was real. It was powerful, a, a way to get what they wanted, just part of the cultural atmosphere, the, the air that they breathe. Now, we've bound up magic as fiction in fantasy novels and movies. Or at least we reject it as an instrument of the principalities and powers. But we're still tempted to follow the same path that the sons of Sceva traveled trying to use the resources at hand to build a comfortable life. All the while, 
sidelining, pushing the one who can give us eternal life off to the side. For the sons of Sceva, magic was a tool, an instrument, and they thought that the name of Jesus just might make it a more powerful kind of magic. For us, that's not the kind of magic that we, we deal with. That, that's not really part of us. But it, there may be other incantations that we speak, spells of individualism, spells of greed, the accumulation of things, spells that help us climb that social ladder, even if it means pushing other people down. So we've got our own books, magic books, spells, and incantations. We've got, we've got our own stuff that needs to be done away with. See, anytime we put our faith in a human institution over God, anytime we, we trust the patterns and the practices of this world instead of trusting God, anytime we follow that supposed wisdom that the world puts out in front of us instead of God's revealed will, the stuff we know Jesus taught us, the things that Jesus showed us, then we've got our own incantations and spells. And no matter what we think they might be worth, and believe me, this culture thinks that it is worth a lot, no matter what we think it's worth, it's really only worth burning. Now, I don't know what happened to these guys, the sons of Sceva. That's they kind of run off into the dark. We don't really follow them anymore. The last we hear, they're, they're driven away after their encounter by this evil spirit. They, they, they disappear naked and, and wounded and ashamed. But because of what happened, something becomes very clear. We know what happened to the Ephesians more generally. We know that they were more open and more receptive to the message of Jesus as a result of this, I think it's ironic, don't you, that this testimony about Jesus comes from an evil spirit. <laughs> it seems like the demons know more than we do sometimes about who Jesus is and his power. They recognize it, and they tremble because of it. But here in this moment, the power of God is made even more evident as these sons of Sceva, these, these itinerant exorcists, run out of the community. And we need to see the same things that that community saw. We need to see the same things that the Ephesians saw. That, you know what? There is no power there. There is no power in that. There's only God. And God is doing extraordinary things. And don't miss that I use the present tense. God is, 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 is doing extraordinary things. Things only God can do. And God is doing the things that God wants done. It's going to happen, sisters and brothers. Everything that God wants is going to happen. It's a guarantee. The question is for us, how aligned are we with that? Are we going our own way, trying to put God in a box and use him to our benefit? Or can we get ourselves aligned with God and what God is doing? Because when we do that, well, we are going to see some miraculous things indeed. Let's pray. Lord, you are awesome. Your power and your majesty and the wonder of who you are beyond our greatest imagining you are. We can't even think up or dream up how good and awesome you are. It goes further. Like Paul says, it is before the beginning, past the end, outside of time, in the spiritual and in the, the visible, we see your great strength and your great love. And Lord, we recognize that all of the plans that we make, only the ones that align with your perfect plan will come about because they are your plans, not ours. 
Lord, at times we have tried to put ourselves on top, tried to make the story about us, tried to do what we wanted to do and to utilize whatever strength you offer to us for our own ends and our own benefit. Lord, when we do this, we need your forgiveness. We need to repent. And so we do repent and we do ask that forgiveness and we trust that you will give it. Lord, help us to be a lot more humble. to search the scriptures faithfully to find your will and then to live in that will knowing that in the end it is only your story that gets told. Lord, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. You would all stand with me as we close with Father, I adore you. mothers and all those who serve as mothers and nurture and care, thank you. It is a blessing to be part of a life that has these folks in it. So give those folks a hug today if you have an opportunity. If you would bow with me. Lord, we ask a blessing on your people. You have brought us to this place. We have heard your word and we have worshiped you. And now you send us out into the world to be the instruments and the servants of your power and your strength and your will. Lord, we ask for your guidance and the courage to follow it. We ask for opportunities to share your love to those that need it. We pray for those who aren't with us today that you may bless them in a special way. And Lord, we look forward again to you gathering us together to do it again, to praise you, to hear your word, and to be sent. We pray all these things in Christ's precious name. Amen. You may go in peace.